there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Britain's a small island with an extraordinary past and amazing landscapes. But what we see above ground is only half the story. I'm travelling the length and breadth of our country to see it from a whole new perspective. Underground. I'm Rob Bell and I'm on a subterranean mission. I'm exploring the mysteries and wonders that lie right under our feet. You've got to make yourself as small as possible. From man-made to natural wonders. There's just so much to take in here. Many are forgotten corners from the darkest points in history. There's a real presence down here. This is an adventure of those places beneath the surface. A journey through underground Britain. This time, I'm in Wales. I'll be exploring castles and the dark medieval secrets that lie beneath them. This is one way to get into a castle. This place is so inaccessible. I'm investigating the sea cave that was the site of Britain's first funeral. And I'll see how deep, dark slate mines beneath Snowdonia roofed the world. Phil, it's enormous. They would have been here for their lifetime, basically. But first, I'm heading to the Brecon Beacons for an extreme subterranean adventure. The beacons here are an absolute haven for altitude junkies. They've got one of the highest peaks in the country, but for an intrepid mole like myself, the greatest natural wonders aren't up here at all. They're deep, and I really do mean deep underground. Beneath the Black Mountain lie the largest show caves in Britain. Giant caverns in the limestone formed 350 million years ago. The labyrinth beyond these show caves holds one of Britain's greatest natural wonders. But I've been told reaching it is an enormous challenge through freezing cold water and tight passages deep underground. Despite the effort it's going to take, I've been assured what lies ahead will be worth it. The journey begins here in the show caves, which are deceptively easy to get into. It really is quite an effect when you first walk into this cave. I mean, the sheer scale of it is one thing, but for me, it's the wonders of nature and the power of nature that's created all of this that leaves me in awe. Danny Rogoff Caves have a history of intrepid exploration. They were first discovered by two local brothers, Tommy and Jeff Morgan, over a hundred years ago. Now they were two local farmers, and essentially all they wanted to do was find out where the river came from. The Morgan brothers boldly explored the unknown underground terrain. They crossed four underground lakes with a small fishing boat, and not knowing if they'd be able to return, ventured deeper and deeper into the caves to discover a magnificent underground world. I guess that's the wonder of uh, being the first people to explore this, in that you've got absolutely no idea what's down there. I mean, if that, if that was me, I'd be, I'd be petrified. They were farmers, you know, they weren't geologists, they weren't explorers, they were farmers. Nobody had gone in there. I mean, nobody had been brave enough, nobody had been stupid enough <laughs> to actually follow into the cave. That's some story. I mean, those boys, hats off, because that, that is real bravery. Being here in these great big show caves near the entrance, where the public can come in, 
it's quite easy to be seduced by the romanticism of that adventure and that, that intrepid spirit. But I want to go deeper into the caves and really try and experience a bit more. Something tells me that romanticism might just wear off a little bit. The show caves are just the beginning. At least 15 kilometers of known cave system lies beyond them, hundreds of meters beneath the ground. Caves are marked by degrees of difficulty. Level five are the most severe. These are level four, so it's going to be a tough journey. But I've enlisted the help of expert caver, Anna Stickland, to guide me in the footsteps of the Morgan brothers and beyond. The first challenge is crossing an underground lake. The whole cave is carved out by this water that I'm struggling through. Over millennia, it's formed this unique cave network, and water's still shaping it today. Everything down here is formed by water, even all this here. But so yeah, it's a slightly different process. Water flows through the limestone rock and deposits calcite, leaving delicate rock formations, stalactites that grow down, and stalagmites, which grow up. It's amazing, it's just kind of mesmerizing. You just stare at it for ages. Over time, as more and more calcite is deposited, more rounded shapes develop. It's still forming that, you see the little water droplets just on the end, and then dripping down, and also making it grow up and down. So that is both really, really old and really, really fresh. Yeah. The deeper I venture into these caves, the more respect I have for the Morgan brothers. They were exploring unknown depths and doing it all by candlelight. Uh, there it is. Right, there you go. That's the difference. I can now, with this, see maybe a metre, maybe, maybe a metre and a half ahead of me. That makes such a difference. If I had to continue the rest of my exploration of the cave like this, I'd be really, really scared. It's quite eerie. And I will not be using that. It's believed that the plucky Morgan brothers got just beyond the lakes before their progress was halted by a tiny passage almost half a kilometre in. Hang on, I've just had a look at this. I'm <laughs> going down that. You're going down that. But I'm going to venture further. Ahead, Anna tells me, there are amazing natural wonders. But first, it's the greatest challenge yet. I'm in Wales, exploring the largest show caves in Britain and what lies beyond in the wonders of Dani Rogoff beneath the Black Mountain. In the depths of this underground labyrinth is the greatest natural wonder, the Cloud Chamber. But first is the challenge of getting there. Almost half a kilometre in, we've reached a tiny passageway. It's believed the first explorers, the Morgan brothers, stopped here. Hang on, I've just had a look at this. I'm <laughs> going down that. You're going down that. All right. I'm stuck. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, okay. This is crazy. Yeah, oh, I'm not even going to look at what's down the other end. I'm just going to get on with it. Oh. oh yeah. <laughs> it's a little shocking. This is a manoeuvre I to call the Robbie Shuffle. Oh. I tell you, 
Partway through the crawl, we've emerged in a small chamber that's particularly significant. Cavers after the Morgan brothers got this far, but ventured no further until the 1960s. Then, a tiny, inexperienced caver, Eileen Davis, a teacher from Swansea, managed to push through and conquer the next section, known as the Long Crawl. It's like it's a head game. Um, it feels unnatural for you to try and force your body through something that's quite tight. Yeah, and I not, can... not knowing what's on the other side or not knowing if you can turn around or retreat if you need to. So it was Harry first went through and purely because you can feel this draft coming through. So you know there's something big on the other side, but you've got to go through this a little bit. Okay, okay so you're getting an airflow through here because yeah. there's a large yeah. chamber or so something. That gives you an indication there's something. All right, okay, now and I'm it interested. Is worth it. it is worth it, I promise. Ugh. I'm struggling to put myself in the frame of mind of Eileen and how she could just push through. Anna's right, this is a battle inside your head. It's not an effort. Scrambling through all these tiny little holes. I've got a 90 degree bend to negotiate here as well. I'm good. Got to think about this. It's such a challenge, willing my body through this tight space. And it's getting tighter. You've just got to make yourself as small as possible. Snake your way through. Okay. That's next. It's very hard to show you perspective here, but that is very, very narrow. What's that? Well, it's about two hand widths, two and a half hand widths. Oh, okay. So, can we now confirm, this is the end of the long crawl? This is the proper end now, yeah. Yeah, you'll soon see that it was all worth it. After an exhausting journey of almost a kilometre through this cave system, my goal, the cloud chamber, lies just around the corner. Okay. All right, this feels a little bit special coming up here. Wow. Look at that. That is amazing. There's hundreds and thousands of them. <laughs> Suddenly this is your world rather than the world you're looking up at. This is the surprise at the end of the tunnel. I'm so pleased you brought me all the way through here. It's a really special place, isn't it? Never seen anything like this before in my life. I could just sit here for a while and take it all in. Deep in the cloud chamber, the limestone is denser and harder, filtering impurities in the water, creating these beautiful straw-like stalactites. Well, and thank you so much for bringing me up here. Obviously, I would not have been able to get here on my own. I'm so pleased I made it all the way. It was tough, but I'm really, really pleased. Thank you. I started off today inspired by the story of the Morgan brothers, and then Eileen. The fact that it was pure curiosity that drove him down here in the first place, just to see what was here. And all the way along, I've been thinking to myself, if that was me in their shoes, would I have kept pushing on? But when you get into a space like this, the cloud chamber, you can start to understand why 
they would come down here. That pursuit of something that no one's ever seen before. You know, sometimes you don't have to travel to the corners of the earth to find the world's natural beauty. Sometimes it's right beneath your feet. That said, there's only one way back out of here. That's the way I came. My next quest takes me close to the English border, to Rhithyn Castle. Wales is known as the land of castles, home to some of Britain's greatest medieval fortresses. They tower over the landscape. But what interests me are the mysterious tunnels and chambers beneath them, and the medieval secrets that they hide. Over 730 years ago, English King Edward I was battling the Welsh. In order to do this, he built castles all over Wales. Rhythyn Castle was one of the first to be built. There's not much of the medieval castle left above ground. And what was standing here three quarters of a millennium ago, when Rhythyn was a mighty fortress, remains a bit of a mystery. But hidden underground, there are far more clues to what was here before. There's one passage on a map that we've never actually been into. It runs the whole length of the courtyard. Will Davis of Cadu tells me no one's been here for over a quarter of a century. First, there's this strange little entrance. This is so tight. Oh. This is one way to get into a castle. Talk about secret passages. This is proper exploration. Ice goes on and on and on. Hello, something here. An opening above gives us our first clue about what this passage is. All these big Edwardian castles, they're palaces effectively with fortifications, they've got plumbing. So you go to visit any of the others, they've got rainwater being collected on rooftops, guided down through channels, through to these great big drains and the hole above our heads, up here, which is blocked later on, I would guess probably brought water down, either from a, a garderobe or a tree shaft or maybe just from the surface to help wash this out. A garderobe was a medieval toilet. I'm not even going to think about if this was a latrine, what might have made its way down here and been no. gushing through all this. Given its purpose as the castle's main sewer, it's an impressive tunnel. But there's a second underground mystery to investigate that seems more promising. Look at this, this is a fantastic little archway down here. If you look back up, you're looking at courtyard level at the top of these steps yeah. into what's now probably a basement. Although now open to the elements, these steps would have led down into a dark chamber underneath the castle. If you look here... What is this here? It's a this, massive hole in the wall. It's a big hole. It's, a, it's what's called a drawbar hole. A large piece of timber would have been drawn from this hole across the door to bolt it firmly shut. Doesn't feel like I'm anywhere near the end. That goes right back. So there might have been a reason that they would have wanted to shut off either this passage or what was in... Yeah, whether that's for a defensive purpose, you've got enemies on the other side or they're up in the courtyard, yeah. or perhaps you're keeping something in here that you don't want people getting at. Now we're talking. Yeah, so... Here, the bar would have been on the outside of the chamber door, locking something or someone inside. But what secrets were locked behind this door? Hang on, it opens up. What's, what's this in here? What you have is a chamber that you can't just walk into. It's below ground level, which brings us to the question of what is it? It could be a store, but that's not very convenient. You've got to get down on a ladder. Why not just at ground level? It's a big castle, you can fit one in. Some sort of water supply or cistern, but again, where does the water come in? 
where does the water go out again? Or you could say it could well be somewhere you would throw somebody that they can't get out of too easily. And it's the closest I think we have to a dungeon. We may have found the remains of a medieval dungeon. But to uncover what it was like being imprisoned in one, I'm heading to nearby Chirk Castle, another of Edward I's border strongholds. This looks a lot more promising. And if it's that impressive above ground, it must have what I'm after down below. King Edward I wanted to keep the Welsh population firmly under control. So he appointed his most ruthless lords to construct and run his castles in these borderlands. Amongst them was Roger Mortimer de Chirk, who built this castle and had a particularly fearsome reputation. This castle is 719 years old this year. It's been constant movement, constant flux, building alteration, all the same. It's lived in. Oh, we're going down. That's right. Yes. Come on. This is what I'm after. This is to our first dungeon. But what lies at the bottom of the stairs isn't quite what I was expecting. Right then. So this is a dungeon then, is it, Hugh? This is where you'd have people imprisoned? Yes, well, a particular sort of prisoner. Well, it, it looks a bit cosy for me. This is a fireplace here, is it? Yeah, that's what I mean. Only wealthy, powerful enemies would have been held in here, hostages rather than prisoners, their high status ensuring they had a more comfortable stay. They'd have had the run of the castle during the day, but here they would have kept themselves warm and quite pleasant at night. But it wasn't just Welsh gentry folk who were held here as hostages. In this very room, we believe that seven French prisoners who'd been taken prisoner at Agincourt were actually transported from here to London. They were simply taken off the battlefield, kept as valuable items to be swapped at a later date. But not all the prisoners here received the noble treatment. Roger Mortimer de Chirk was infamous for his harsher punishments. Now it's said that in the early days of his living here, a priest came up from the village of Chirk to remonstrate with Roger Mortimer about his licentious and debauched ways. Now, what happened to the priest was quite singular. Apparently, so the story goes, he was thrown into the lower dungeon beneath us at this moment, and after two days, he was tied to his horse, the horse was smacked, and he was sent down to Chirk again. Nobody messed with Roger Mortimer. You mentioned a lower dungeon beneath our feet. Oh, yes. Would you like to see it? I definitely would. Yes, he. Follow me. Deep in the lower dungeon is where things turned really nasty. I'm at Chirk Castle on the Welsh borders, exploring the underground tunnels and chambers full of dark mysteries and dungeons. I'm being led to the depths of the lower dungeon to find out the horrors of medieval punishment. Oh, wow, yeah. That was not a false promise, Hugh. This is a real deal, isn't it? You're nine metres below the ground now. The only source of light and ventilation comes from tiny shafts high up in the thick castle walls. So at the time, you really were at the whim of, of Mortimer or uh, the lord who may have oh, succeeded here. Absolutely. His word was law. And the story of the priest, I guess, in some sense, is he was lucky in that he got out alive. Oh, yes. Whereas perhaps others weren't quite as lucky and their fate ended here. Absolutely. And the brutality continued long after Roger Mortimer. Of course, the castle went on having its dungeon used way into the 16th century. In 1522, the constable of the tower then sent out to, to pay eight pence for new iron for the rivets, for the bolts, for the prisoners. 
So not just locked away down here, chained up as well, you think? Yes. Anywhere but in these walls. Goodness me. What a horrific, <laughs> horrific end. These dungeons really are chilling places. Being alone in one, it doesn't take long to grasp the misery of dungeon life. And that's even with the luxury of a candle, something most prisoners wouldn't have had. It really is quite horrible down here. You feel completely cut off from the outside world. It's eerily quiet, it's cold, it's damp, and it's very, very dark. Next, my underground exploration takes me south to the Gower Peninsula and a cliff with an extraordinary prehistoric story to tell, a weird ancient burial known as the Red Lady of Paviland. There's no going back really now. Any ways down. There we go. This time, I'm headed down to a unique archaeological site at the bottom of Paviland Cliff. <laughs> oh, wow. Unless there's an exceptionally low tide, this is the only way to access it. I'm going to investigate a remarkable Stone Age burial that was unearthed in Goat's Hole Cave. Oh, this place is hard to get to, isn't it? Just a little bit. Whew. It's worth it, though. That's fantastic. Oh, that is brilliant. Nice. So much fun. Nice to meet you, Ron. How are you How going? You Very good. So the cave is just here. This is Goat's Hole Cave. The cliff that you're on is Paviland. Local adventurer Andrew Price is guiding me round the caves. If you follow me this way, it's formed of Carboniferous Limestone, which is about 350 million years old. Carboniferous Limestone is water-soluble, so water coming through small fissures in the rock opens it out. So the cave that we're in was, at one time, an underground cave system. Wow. And it was just the, the action of an ice age, glaciers, just basically chewed the front off this cave and exposed it to the elements. Gower has probably hundreds of miles of cave systems. Some of them have been explored, lots of them haven't. So this is just one part. But this one's special because almost 200 years ago, a mysterious human skeleton known as the Red Lady of Paviland was found. What I want you to imagine is in about 1823, this cave wasn't open like this. It was actually full of all sorts of rock and earth and debris. Uh, up to about two-thirds of the height. So uh, it was dug, and as they were digging down, probably to about this level here, this is where the bones were found. Who was digging all this out? It was a gentleman called Reverend William Buckland, who was the Dean of Oxford University Geology Department. William Buckland was later to become the Dean of Westminster Abbey and was a devout Christian. So then what exactly did he find? He found an almost complete human skeleton. Wow. At pretty much this level, missing the skull, but most of the other body parts were there. Okay. Now, the bones had been stained bright red, and interestingly, they were also found with things like drilled periwinkle shells, pieces of ivory, and a complete mammoth skull. A mammoth skull? A mammoth skull. Buckland drew a sketch of his findings, showing where he found the bones in the cave. But the combination of human and mammoths together gave Buckland a problem. Buckland was thrown into something of a quandary. As a creationist, he couldn't understand how human bones could be found alongside bones that were supposedly of creatures that only existed prior to the Great Flood. Buckland believed that the world was made by God, exactly as described in the Bible, and that the Earth was just 6,000 years old. It threw all his um, religious beliefs into disarray, and to, to balance that, he came up with the notion that the mammoth skull and mammoth bones and things like that had been washed in here separately, and they'd all become mixed together. At a different time. Yes, yeah. The human skeleton created a further challenge. It had been carefully buried with special objects, 
and some of the bones were coloured red. So um, he assumed that the bones were those of a woman, first of all, based on the fact that they found the periwinkle shells, which had been drilled into a form of necklace. Okay. And no upstanding Victorian gentleman would ever wear jewellery. So he thought it was either a prostitute or a witch. Why did Buckland just assume that she was a prostitute? Well, some people say that it's because the bones were stained red that she was somehow a scarlet woman. But uh, as it turned out, the bones were far more interesting than that. Buckland never knew this, though. But first, I want to know why would our ancient ancestors have chosen a burial site that's so difficult to access? Elizabeth Walker from the National Museum Wales is showing me the cave from a different perspective. She's brought me here to enlighten me on what it would have looked like in the early Stone Age when the burial took place. This would have been a very different landscape. We wouldn't be bobbing around on the sea as we are today. We'd be in a big open plain full of grassland. Now it's the Bristol Channel. What's that? That's North Devon coast. That's over right, there. yes. So between here and there, you'd have been able to walk You'd across. probably been able to walk. The sea level would have been 250 feet lower, meaning the coastline would have been miles away from the cave. So what does that mean for the cave here? Back then, would it have been up high? Yes, you'd have had a, a hill to climb to get up to that cave. But that cave itself would have been an ideal vantage point for these hunter-gatherers. If you imagine that this grassland is full of big mammals like mammoths, woolly rhinoceroses and wild horse, those would have provided them with their source of food as well. Elizabeth's taken me to Swansea Museum to uncover the real Red Lady of Paviland, and there are a few surprises in store. These are exact replicas of the bones found in the caves, and shockingly, they reveal that Buckland's Red Lady of Paviland isn't a lady at all. She's a man. So is it actually quite obvious that these bones were from a man and not a woman, as Buckland had said? Yes, indeed, because we can tell from the pelvis. Okay. Um, a male pelvis has quite a tight uh, notch here, whereas mm -hmm. a female, it's much wider. That's immediately obvious to anybody who in the know, is it? It is, yes, that's right. Oh, so Buckland. it's remarkable that um, Buckland didn't actually recognise this when he was creating the female stories he came up with. Wow. So then what about the red colouring of the bones? Well, um, the red colouring comes from red ochre. Red ochre is a natural pigment containing hydrated iron oxide, often found with ancient burials. So the staining had nothing to do with witchcraft, as Buckland thought. What is unusual, I think, about this particular one is that it's the bones that have stained red rather than just a pile of ochre being placed beneath the skeleton. It might have been used as a preservative in some clothing that the skeleton might have been buried in. A garment placed on his legs at his funeral could account for the greater staining found on the lower part of the skeleton. So that seems to me like quite a formal burial then. He certainly was buried in a very formal way. With the skeleton, there were specially placed grave goods, including these periwinkle shells. So it could have been someone with a fair amount of status. That's possible, yes. Yeah, certainly somebody with, um, who required this, um, this very rich uh, burial in a cave. Radiocarbon dating carried out in 2007 actually shows the Red Man of Paviland died 29,000 years ago. It was found with the mammoth head as well, so is that consistent that that mammoth would have been around that time as well? That's right, yes, and we believe in fact that um, the mammoth skull was actually uh, placed in the grave. Not washed in separately, as Buckland thought. For Britain, this is the oldest formal burial of a modern human, just like ourselves, that we know of. So Buckland actually found something really, really special. Yes, he did. Buckland may have got many of the facts wrong, and the story may not be as colourful as a red witch or prostitute. 
but his discovery is still the oldest known ceremonial burial ever found in Great Britain. My subterranean adventure next takes me to the mountains of Snowdonia, and underground wealth that transformed the region's fortunes. I'm on a mission to find out how the mining in this valley around Blyn Alpha Stiniog roofed the world from London to Australia, and how it brought both wealth and hardship to the local community. So this is the entrance down into the quarry that the miners themselves would have taken. It's quite comfy for me here in the train, but uh, back then when they were working, they would have had to walk down here. I'm descending 120 metres to Lechwed Slate Caverns. They opened in 1836 and at their height were one of the biggest slate mines in the world. During the 1890s, the Welsh slate industry produced a third of all the world's slate. It was transported all over the British Empire, to North America and India. It even went to Germany, their biggest customer. It transformed the economy of the whole of Wales. But how did they manage to mine such vast quantities of slate from deep beneath these unyielding mountains? Phil Jones's family mined in these caverns for generations. It feels like these tunnels just go on and on and on. Well, they do go on for 25 miles altogether. 25 miles? That's almost a marathon's worth. Yeah. There's a marathon's worth of tunnelling network down here. Yeah. These mines are huge, measuring 600 metres from top to bottom, with 16 levels and 250 chambers where the men extracted the slate. Incredibly, this vast man-made warren was entirely dug and blasted by hand. Phil, it's enormous. It is, isn't it? <laughs> Something like this would take them around 20 years to dig out all the slate. They would have been here for their lifetime, basically. And all by candlelight as well. So they never even got to see how impressive this no, is. No. After 20 years, your yeah. life's work. Yeah. This whole chamber was dug out by just two people who spent their entire working life in one place. This is, uh, this is what they would have used, their hand drill. This is called a jumper. And all it is, it's a steel rod uh, with two chiseled ends and a 10-pound weight at the bottom. That would be called the clap because of the noise that it made when it hit the rock surface. And all they would do is just start to hole off this drill and give it a twist as they're going along. And once they got to around two inches, yeah. they'd blow the candle out because candles cost money in those days. So then they'd be working in darkness? In the darkness. Just totally chiseling away like you were there? Yeah, just going like this. The miners would drill into the run of the slate to create a hole and fill it with gunpowder. They used makeshift fuses, which were extremely unreliable. They could take ages to burn or just go off in their hand. That would blow off a, a big chunk of slate. Would big it? chunk, yeah. Three tons is the biggest that you could take out. Any more than that's too heavy, basically. They chop them down to size down here, and then they haul them up to the surface. I'll be finding out how they transformed the blocks of slate into valuable commodities that changed the face of this small Welsh valley. I'm in Blynau for Stiniog on a mission to find out how the mining in this small Welsh valley roofed the world. Here at the Chlechwed Slate Caverns, large blocks of slate mined below ground were skillfully transformed into highly profitable commodities. A split in slate, you always go in the middle. All right. OK, never to the side or you'll just chip away. So you go always to the middle. Right. You got a crack straight. Oh, it's gone right through, straight away. Yeah. Wow. It's going down the natural run of the slate. But for every tonne, there was about 10 tonnes of waste due to the natural faults of the stone. But if the slate was of high quality, 
Each person could create 500 roofing tiles a day. OK. And the slate cutters were paid per slate. What they did was um, they did 100 slates, but in actual they had to do 133. The other 33 was going to the company, um, like insurance, if uh, any of them broke. Now it's my turn to finish it off. So this will be the final cut now? Yeah. Right. To be sold as a roofing slate, it had to be split to an eighth of an inch. That's it. Feels like it's fragile, but if you get it in the right place... It's OK. That's lovely. Yeah, we we'll could use that. That's we'll usable. Use that one. You reckon you could sell that? Yeah. That's not as easy as it might look. Uh, there's a lot of precision there, and you never know what's going to be inside the slate. No. The business was so successful that this railway was built in the 1830s to transport the huge quantities of slate to the harbour at Porth Madog, down the valley, over 13 miles away. So there, on average, how often would this, would the train be doing the journey between the port and the quarries? At the height of the railway's prosperity, you'd have had two down trains of slate each day, and they might have been carrying as much as 200 tonnes. So imagine each one of those as carrying enough slate to roof about 75 terrace houses. Wow! The slate was taken to the port to be transported all over the world. The town of Porth Madoc didn't exist before the slate industry, and the very fact it was created is testament to the success of the slate mines. I suppose you could say the benefits of the railway spread all the way down the valley, because whereas Pistignog was home to the slate quarrymen, Port Madog would have been home to the sea captains and the mariners. So really, you could say that this was a, like a, a, not a boom town, it was a boom valley in the 19th century. In its prime, it was a world leader in the slate industry. However, by 1914, Britain had gone to war with Germany. The biggest market for Welsh slate disappeared overnight. The Great Depression and manufactured tiles hit demand for natural slate, and by the 1970s, the mines were a shadow of what they were. But even during the boom years, the harsh reality of mining took its toll on the men below ground. One of their biggest dangers and one of their biggest enemies would have been the darkness. In Welsh, it's called Diskindros de Divan, and that is falling over the deep. So you could be falling from one level down to the other, and that's a 70 foot drop straight down off the edge. And you're, if you do that, then you, you're not going to tell the tale. And there were other dangers that were just as concealed. The old man used to say, it's not the dust you can see that's dangerous, it's the dust that you can't. And you get a disease called silicosis, and that's the dust going onto your lungs, sitting like concrete, and then you can't breathe. So uh, by the time you would be 35, you'd be thinking about retiring in the Victorian times. Um, and by the time you were 40, between 40 and 50, you'd be passed away. Phil's father and grandfather were some of the last miners to work here in the 1970s extracting slate from this very cavern. My grandfather, he had an accident. He went back to the blast, and the blast went off prematurely, and um, so he lost the use of his hand. And I remember blue freckles up his arm where, his, where the slate had embedded into his arm. Um, did he ever come back down then? I don't think he did after that, um, no. Um, but he wasn't the same after that, really. As soon as you come down here, it's impossible not to be hugely impressed by the engineering achievement of this place. And it's clear that the riches contained within this mine transform the economy of the area and of all of Wales. But at what cost? Having heard all the stories and even seen up close the tool marks in the side of the caverns, it's impossible still for me to put myself in the shoes of the men who sometimes spent most of their lives down here. Next time, I'm travelling to the centre of underground England to explore a den of iniquity in Buckinghamshire. It's kinky, isn't it? Fight fires with underground rescuers. Oh, extinguish it. Put the fire out, please. And unravel Nottingham's medieval murder mystery.